In this video, we're going to be exploring the reaction named after the Italian chemist Canizzaro. The Canizzaro reaction is useful because it gives us a way to convert an aldehyde group to a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. This reaction doesn't work on all aldehydes though, and it only works on aldehyde groups that do not have an acidic alpha hydrogen. The reaction occurs under strong basic conditions, and an alpha hydrogen will react and form side products. If any of you aren't sure what an alpha hydrogen is, I've included a small written explanation here. For this video, I decided to use benzaldehyde as the aldehyde, which will form benzyl alcohol and benzoic acid as products. I chose to use benzaldehyde because it's probably the easiest aldehyde for me to get, and the products that it forms in this reaction are quite useful. Benzyl alcohol is mainly used as a solvent and as a precursor in the perfume and flavoring industry. It can also apparently be used as a weak local anesthetic. Benzoic acid is commonly used as a food preservative and as a precursor to plasticizers or phenol. In one of my earlier videos, I didn't use benzoic acid directly, but I used its salt form sodium benzoate to make benzene. The benzene was then used in a lengthy synthesis to make scatol, which smells exactly how it sounds. In another video, I used both the benzyl alcohol and the benzoic acid to make denatonium benzoate, which is the most bitter compound that we know of. If you guys are interested in seeing any of the videos that I mentioned, I'll provide some links in the description. For this reaction, I need two main chemicals. On the left, I have benzaldehyde, and on the right, I have sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide was purchased locally from a hardware store, and the benzaldehyde was distilled from bitter almond oil. In Canada, I'm fine, but keep in mind that bitter almond oil and benzaldehyde are controlled substances in the US. Benzaldehyde slowly oxidizes in the presence of air, so before using it, it's generally a good idea to clean it. To clean it up, it's normally first washed with a sodium bicarbonate solution, followed by a distillation. The major reason for the distillation step is to just dry the benzaldehyde, but for this reaction, it doesn't matter if things are a little wet. So to save some time, I'm just going to skip the distillation step. Into this little beaker, I poured 30 milliliters of saturated sodium bicarbonate solution. On top of this, I poured in 20 milliliters of the benzaldehyde. I covered the top with some plastic wrap to prevent oxidation, and then I turned on the stirring. Once the stirring gets going and the layers actually start to mix, it's going to become opaque. When benzaldehyde is oxidized by air, it forms benzoic acid, and what we're trying to do here is neutralize it. In the presence of sodium bicarbonate, the benzoic acid should react with it to form sodium benzoate, which will dissolve into the water. The amount of time here that I stirred things is kind of arbitrary, but after about 5 or 10 minutes, I turned off the stirring, and you can see that the layers start to separate. It is possible to separate off the upper benzaldehyde layer by just pouring it off, but it's honestly kind of a pain. When trying to separate two liquids that don't mix together, a separatory funnel makes things so much easier. So once it was added to the separatory funnel, I wait for the layers to separate, and then I drain off the lower water layer. The upper layer that remains in the separatory funnel should be relatively clean benzaldehyde. I would normally wash it a few times with distilled water, but even if a little bit of sodium bicarbonate is present, it's not a big deal in this reaction. I now need to prepare a sodium hydroxide solution, so I cap the separatory funnel and I'll come back to it in a minute. Into an Erlenmeyer flask, I added 15 milliliters of water, followed by 15 grams of sodium hydroxide. Once all the sodium hydroxide had dissolved, I added the benzaldehyde that we cleaned just a minute ago. I initially added it slowly, but there's no real need to do this, and it can all be dumped in at once. Once everything had been added, I washed the separatory funnel with a little bit of water. At this point, I'm done adding chemicals to the flask, so I replaced the funnel with a glass stopper. I set up a water bath under the reaction flask, and I heat it to 100C. Heating the reaction will increase the reaction rate, 
and it will make it go to completion faster. At 100 C, it takes less than 30 minutes for the reaction to be complete, but at room temperature, it might take several hours. As the reaction proceeds, we'll go from an opaque white mixture to an almost clear orange solution. In the presence of sodium hydroxide, the benzaldehyde will undergo a Canitsaro reaction. This will lead to the formation of two main products, benzyl alcohol and sodium benzoate. In most reactions, the reactant either gets oxidized or reduced, but here we actually have both going on. Some of the benzaldehyde is being reduced to benzyl alcohol, and some of it is being oxidized to the sodium benzoate. The technical term for this type of reaction is a disproportionation. For those of you who are interested in knowing more details, I've provided a small write-up here. So in terms of the mechanism, this is what's going on. The first reaction that occurs is between the benzaldehyde and the hydroxide ions from the sodium hydroxide. This generates the intermediate molecule species 1, which has one negatively charged oxygen. This intermediate can then react with another hydroxide ion to form species 2. Both of these intermediates will then undergo a redox reaction with another benzaldehyde molecule. The electrons on the oxygen move to form a double bond, and a hydride anion is donated to the benzaldehyde. The result of this is that species 1 and 2 get oxidized, and the benzaldehyde gets reduced. In the case of species 1, we form benzoic acid and a deprotonated benzyl alcohol, and with species 2, both of them are deprotonated. Under these basic conditions, and in the presence of water, some proton transfers occur, and we end up with the same products. In the final product, I've included the sodium counter ion, but I didn't include it for any of the other steps. I did this mostly for simplicity, and for all of the intermediates, you can assume that every negative charge is balanced by a sodium ion. A final thing to point out is that the actual reaction produces sodium benzoate, and it's going to be converted to benzoic acid during the workup. After 30 minutes, the hot water bath is removed, and I let the solution cool. As it cools, we can see that a solid is slowly starting to form. By the time it reaches room temperature, the contents of the flask will more or less solidify. I now have a mixture of solid sodium benzoate salt and liquid benzyl alcohol, and I need to separate them. The first step in the purification is to dissolve the sodium benzoate in a minimal amount of water. I initially needed to use a metal spatula, but as things loosen up, the stir bar should start to work again. Once all of the sodium benzoate had dissolved, I was left with this nice and clear orange solution. Dissolved in this solution, we have both the sodium benzoate and the benzyl alcohol. To separate them, I'm going to take advantage of their very different solubilities. Benzyl alcohol is much more soluble in organic solvent than water, but the opposite is true for sodium benzoate. Using a solvent that's immiscible with water, I should be able to extract the benzyl alcohol without really touching the sodium benzoate. So to do this, I start off by adding 20 milliliters of dichloromethane to the separatory funnel. Dichloromethane, also referred to as DCM, doesn't mix well with water, so it quickly forms a layer at the bottom. The funnel is replaced with a stopper, and I start to shake the separatory funnel. The shaking step is very important because it allows us to mix together the water and the dichloromethane. During this mixing step, we're trying to get as much of the benzyl alcohol to come out of the water and to dissolve into the dichloromethane instead. The funnel is placed back on the stand and the layers will start to separate. The bottom layer that's forming is the dichloromethane and it should contain most of the benzyl alcohol. Once the layers have more or less completely separated, the bottom one containing the product is drained into a beaker. The washing step is then repeated two more times, so in the end we have a total of three washings. After each washing, the dichloromethane is drained into the same beaker as before. Once I'm done washing it for a third time with the dichloromethane, there should be little to no benzyl alcohol left in the water layer. The top layer should not be thrown out though, 
because it still contains our sodium benzoate. I'm going to process the benzyl alcohol first, so for temporary storage, I pour it into a beaker, and I'll come back to it later. Okay, so all of the DCM washings that we just collected are then poured into a clean separatory funnel. What I need to do now is purify out the benzyl alcohol from this crude DCM solution. The first step is to get rid of any unreacted benzaldehyde that might have been extracted along with the benzyl alcohol. To do this, I added a small amount of sodium sulfite solution and I shook the separatory funnel to mix things up. If there's any benzaldehyde present, it should react with the bisulfite to form something called a bisulfite adduct. Benzaldehyde is much more soluble in DCM, but the bisulfite adduct is more soluble in water. So once the layer separated, I drained off the lower DCM layer and I discarded the upper water layer. The DCM solution was poured back into the separatory funnel and I washed it a couple times with distilled water. This helps get rid of any water soluble contaminants that might still remain. After the last washing, I was left with a murky yellow solution. The solution is opaque because there's a lot of water present and I'm going to need to dry it up. To absorb the water, I add some anhydrous magnesium sulfate. I gently swirl it around and the solution quickly clears up. I did use a little bit too much magnesium sulfate here and I probably should have used substantially less. Anyway, I let it stand for several minutes and then I moved on to filtering off the salt. As a filter, I just used a glass funnel packed with a little bit of cotton. The next step is a distillation, so I filter things directly into a round bottom flask. Once everything had filtered through, I washed the salt at the bottom with a little bit of fresh DCM. This also serves to wash any product that might remain on the funnel or trapped in the cotton. So once everything is passed through, I remove the funnel and I set things up for a distillation. Using a heating mantle, I heat up the flask and I start to distill over the contents. The first thing that comes over is dichloromethane and it's a little bit cloudy due to the presence of water. To verify that it was in fact just water, I dumped in a little bit of anhydrous magnesium sulfate. You can see that the solution clears up, which confirms that it is just water. Anyway, in this beaker, I collected everything that came over up until about 200 C. At the 200 Celsius mark, I removed the beaker and I replaced it with this small vial. What's coming over now is the benzyl alcohol, and I collect everything between 200 and 206 C. The boiling point of pure benzyl alcohol is between 205 and 206, but the stuff I'm distilling over now isn't super pure, and the boiling point is a little bit lower. I don't do it in this video, but if you need the benzyl alcohol to be super pure, you can just run a second or even a third distillation. When the temperature goes above 206 C, there still might be some stuff coming over, but it's important not to collect it. The stuff that comes over above this temperature isn't benzyl alcohol, and if you collect it, it's just going to contaminate your product. So once I saw the temperature rising above 206, I stopped the distillation. What I was left with was some nice crystal clear benzyl alcohol, and in the distilling flask, there was a bunch of red-orange crap. At this point, I'm done processing the benzyl alcohol, and I'm going to move on to the sodium benzoate. Okay, so here's the sodium benzoate solution from before. The first thing that I want to do is get rid of any residual dichloromethane, so I drop in a stir bar and I turn on the hot plate. The boiling point of dichloromethane is quite low, so the heat doesn't need to be turned up that much. As it heats up, the solution clears, and we can see some bubbles coming off as the dichloromethane starts to boil. The solution is heated at about 60 C until dichloromethane stops coming off. The next step generates heat and the solution is already hot, so to cool it down I dump in some ice cubes. I turn on the stirring and then I swap the white background for a black one because it'll make things a lot easier to see. 
To separate the sodium benzoate from solution, I'm going to be converting it to benzoic acid using hydrochloric acid. Sodium benzoate is very soluble in water, but benzoic acid isn't, so as it forms, it starts to precipitate out. It quickly becomes thick enough that the stir bar doesn't work, and I need to mix things using a glass stir rod. I continue to add acid, and I occasionally check the pH using universal pH paper. Once the pH paper tells me I have a pH of about 1, I'm done adding the acid, and I can move on to filtration. The benzoic acid is vacuum filtered off, and the beaker is washed a few times to transfer as much of it as possible. The water used to wash the beaker is also used to wash the benzoic acid that's in the filter. This is important to get rid of any other water-soluble contaminants or hydrochloric acid that might still remain. Once I'm done washing it, I leave the vacuum on for a few minutes to dry things up. The damp powder is then transferred to a beaker. Into the beaker, I pour in 200 milliliters of water, and I turn on the hot plate. What I'm doing now is purifying the benzoic acid by a technique known as recrystallization. I'm going to dissolve all of the benzoic acid in boiling water, and then I'm going to let it cool down slowly. As it cools, crystals of benzoic acid will form, and impurities should be left in the water. I needed to add a little bit of extra water, but eventually everything dissolved. I covered the top of the beaker with some plastic wrap, and I took it off the hot plate. I removed the stir bar using a magnet, and then I waited for the crystals to form. Unfortunately though, the benzoic acid seemed to crash out, and I didn't form any nice crystals. This usually happens when the solution is too concentrated, so I decided to do it again, but use more water. This time, the crystals that form are much nicer, and the difference is pretty evident. To fully crystallize the benzoic acid, I place it in the freezer for about an hour. Then just like before, I vacuum filtered off the crystals, and I washed everything with a little bit of water. The damp crystals were then transferred to a piece of paper to air dry. After a day or so of drying, I was left with some nice fluffy benzoic acid crystals. The crystals were then jammed into a vial, and placed next to the benzyl alcohol. Okay, so here's the final yield of both of the products. On the left is the benzyl alcohol, and on the right is the benzoic acid. In theory, half of the benzaldehyde should become benzyl alcohol, and half should become the benzoic acid. So we should get an equal percent yield of each. But when I do the calculations, this doesn't seem to be the case. The yield of benzyl alcohol was 51%, and the yield of benzoic acid was 62%. The major reason why the percent yields aren't the same is because the products were isolated using very different techniques. Immediately after the reaction, there was equal amounts of each, but it seems like the extraction of the benzyl alcohol was just less efficient. It does make sense though, because for the benzyl alcohol, I had to do a solvent extraction followed by a distillation, whereas for the benzoic acid, all I needed to do was add some acid and filter it off. The actual efficiency of the reaction is likely very close to the crude yield of the benzoic acid before the recrystallization. The crude yield was about 68%, so the reaction efficiency is probably slightly higher, maybe around 70%. So knowing the reaction efficiency is somewhere around 70%, I know that I lost 19% of my benzyl alcohol somewhere in the workup. This clearly tells me that my workup wasn't very efficient, and it's off in some way. For a fun exercise, I'd like you guys to suggest why I lost so much of the alcohol. Feel free to criticize anything involving my technique or the method that I used. If you're feeling creative, you can suggest a totally different way to isolate it, or you can attack things like the solvents that I used, the washing steps, etc. Basically, just suggest anything that you think could raise the yield and help close this 19% gap. 
Anyway, I think that's about all I have to say about the reaction. The next video that I film and post is going to be a surprise. Also, I finally received my Nile Red beakers, and I've opened up a shop online. The website is just nilred.ca, and if any of you are interested in checking it out, there's a link in the description. So as usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Everyone who supports me will see my videos 24 hours before I release them to YouTube. Also, if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end of the video like you see here. Here's just a small list of some of the future videos that I'll post. If you guys have any other ideas, please let me know in the comments.